This program is made possible in part by the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, one of America's top research universities, preparing students for today's interdependent world with internationally focused academic and outreach programs. The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Now, here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. The current drug epidemic in the United States is unprecedented in its death toll. Overdoses have become the leading cause of death for Americans under age 50, prompting an urgent search by policymakers for an effective response. Historically, much of the focus of the nation's drug policy has been on criminalization and punishment. However, the global scope of the problem has given rise to alternative approaches in other countries that focus less on law enforcement and more on treatment. To help us explore where these public health-oriented responses have been implemented and the results they've achieved, we're joined today by Hannah Hetzer, Senior International Policy Manager at the New York-based Drug Policy Alliance, where she serves as liaison for Latin American and broader international issues. She previously worked with the Latin America Unit of the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the Americas Division at Human Rights Watch, and the Human Rights Foundation. And I welcome to International Focus. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm wondering uh, if we could start with just some sense of the scope of the problem, uh, particularly here in the U.S. I mean, how, how big of a, an issue is this right now? I mean, the scope of, of this is, is tragic. It is the deadliest drug epidemic in this country, responsible for 175 deaths a day. Um, so it's, it's a tragedy we need to look uh, to act um, on immediately, locally, on a national scale. But it's not the first drug epidemic in this country or in the world. So I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned from first looking inwardly and making sure we don't re repeat the mistakes of the past, um, where we've really focused on punitive approaches in this country, and also to look outwards towards other countries that have faced similar drug crises and took a more public health oriented approach which led to much more successful health outcomes and, and take lessons from, from both of those uh, to create a new policy that is focused on, on the people um, that are at the heart of this problem and places health first. So the current crisis that, uh, that's facing the U.S. is geographically much wider than the U.S. or, or is it just uh, we're facing it now but other places have faced it Previously, I, you know, currently um, there is nowhere else in the world that's facing the same scope of this problem as North America and, and particularly the United States and Canada with its overdose rates. Um, and and I mean, they, they have surpassed like all uh, accidental overdose, accidental deaths, traffic fatalities. Um, and we're not seeing the same uh, level of overdose deaths in other countries. Um, that hasn't meant it hasn't happened in the past, but I think other countries have been better equipped and have had a different mentality to deal with it. But right now we're not seeing, for example, the same rise in um, fentanyl related deaths in Europe, not even in, the, in some of the countries where uh, some of these drugs are being manufactured. It seems like right now it's really hitting North America, um, and, and I hope it's not going to uh, grow on a global scale. But obviously, there's, there's no country that's not, uh, not touched by, um, you know, drug-related deaths and harm. So this is, it's a global, it's a gro global phenomenon, um, but there's a particular aspect in the States right now with overdose deaths. Well, let's look, if we could, at, uh, at sort of the historical approach that particularly the United States has taken. There certainly have been uh, problems with users of illicit drugs for a very long time. And we've got a, a slide. There was a, uh, a narcotics commissioner who uh, spent several decades running it. Uh, we've got a slide here. His name is Henry Anslinger. And as you see here, he's saying the major criminal in the United States is the drug addict. Of all the offenses committed against the laws of this country, the narcotic addict is the most frequent offender. I think we've got a, a newspaper clipping from the time, uh, War on Dope Gets Results. So we have a long history in this country of putting this on a, a war footing, if you will, the war mm -hmm. on drugs. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. So as I said, you know, this isn't the first drugs crisis, 
But we are starting to talk about it in a little bit of a different way. And I think it's important to remember how we dealt for, um, with, for example, the crack epidemic in the 80s and 90s, where that was really in associated um, in perception uh, with African-American community. And so at that time, there was no talk of a public health approach or treatment or support. It was all law enforcement, all incarceration, all punitive. Um, and, and right now we're, you know, we're a country that locks up more people than anywhere else in the world, 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prison population, and our drug war has really had to do with that in a big way. And it has always not just fallen uh, most heavily on, on black and brown communities here, that's been uh, intentional and by design in the way that we've criminalized drugs um, based on who we assume to be using them. And now we're, we're hearing much more um, about the opioid crisis being framed in, in public health terms, um, which is great, but I think a lot of that comes from the, the perception that uh, the people who are, are facing um, harms of opioid use are, are white, are rural, um, maybe middle class, and, and not to negate for it from, from the idea of using public health languages, but I think it's really important for us to remember that history um, and the way we approached it in the past to make sure that Whatever we do now, when we, when we provide support and treatment and health approaches, we do so evenly. And that whatever our criminal justice approach be, that it be fair and still not disproportionately affect um, low-income people um, and communities of color. Well, let's uh, sort of break down the, the sort of constituent parts of this crisis, if we could. Uh, first of all, one of the things we hear about is just the origins of... Some of the issues people face is uh, with prescription drugs that were prescribed by their physician. So that's one part of it. Talk a little bit about how that works. Yeah, so, um, and, and this is also very interesting to put into the international perspective because um, the United States, uh, with its extreme over prescription of pain medication, that has been one of the factors that has pushed this. Um, and there is, you know, there, there's a lobby behind prescription pain medications. There are, are companies that, um, that have promoted them towards doctors. And, and this is definitely a country where there is vast over prescription. Um, and, and there needs to be higher regulations around prescribing, but it also needs to be balanced and nuanced. And I think something that's sometimes lost in the debate here is that though the United States faces an over-prescribing uh, problem, most of the world actually is facing a dearth of pain medication. So, um, and that has to do with our international drug control regime. So a lot of countries have interpreted, you know, the, the UN conventions and, and the overly punitive um, and prohibitionist international drug control approach to kind of cut back and overly regulate um, prescription pain medications, especially the ones that come from uh, poppy and, and based on, on opiates. And so there are the majority of countries in the world, there are actually people who are dying in pain without access to pain medications. So we can't forget that and can't forget that there is a need for these essential medications. But we need to strike the right balance where those who need it get it, but it's not over-prescribed um, and it's not prescribed for, you know, the, the kind of minutest of, of pain conditions. And, um, and I think that's, that's a conversation that has to be balanced and has to happen. Um, and, and right now, you know, I, I'm worried that it might swing too much the other way. I don't think it would ever look like, like the countries that right now are, are facing a complete dearth of these medications, but we need to keep both of those things in focus. So uh, sort of next on, on the progression then is diversion of prescription opioids, where they end up being uh, used by people for whom they weren't originally prescribed. Talk a little bit about how that works. Yeah, I think because there's such an over-prescription problem in this country, there are there are more drugs than people actually need, so there's more drugs than, than people are actually using. Um, and if we, if we got the balance right of, of prescribing, then those who actually need the pain medication would be using them, and there wouldn't be this you know, over, over prescription and over supply problem, which then uh, they can either you know, be found in, in people's home by other family members or even like be um, diverted to the black market. So it, it comes back to this, this problem of, uh, of over prescribing. Um, and I would hope that the kind of medical and academic communities in this country can really think about better ways to, to deal with that. And then uh, finally, just, you know, 
the, the drugs that are supplied outside the, the formal system. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how some of those uh, new synthetics have played into this. Yeah, so, you know, there's, there, there has been, you know, some progression of, of people who become addicted to pain medications um, and then might seek alternatives that are, are cheaper and are illicit. Um, and the, the big problem with the illicit supply of drugs is that you don't know what's in them. Um, they're not regulated, they're not controlled. And so when we see uh, substances like fentanyl and carfentanyl um, making their way into the heroin supplies, it becomes extremely dangerous because people who have de developed addictions and dependencies might think they're getting one thing, but they don't know. And, and often also the times who the, often, sometimes the people who sell it to them don't know what's in their supply either. Um, you know, it's not, it's not in anyone's intention to ever kill um, someone with these, with these supply of drugs. It's, it's a problem of lack of, um, of regulation of things like drug checking, where you can actually test your substances, know what's in them, so that people can actually uh, make informed decisions because people aren't trying to overdose, they're not trying to to die um, when they're when when they when they have dependencies, and and that's the that's the big problem with the illicit um, supply of, of drugs. We just don't know what's in them, so we don't know the harms of them, and um, and that's that is one of the reasons why, you know, eventually we need to study um, things like drug checking and potentially what it would look like to to regulate substances. So, what are the drivers of of this current epidemic? I mean, obviously there there have been sort of the constituent factors present in our society for some time. But what, what's changed in the last few years? So I think there's, there's a multitude of things behind you know, this current epidemic and, and the, the change in regulations around prescribing um, have been a cause. But there have always been people who have used drugs and there have always been, you know, there's always been problematic drug use. And that goes back to um, you know a whole multitude of factors. Sometimes it's social, you know, lack of of a social safety net. Um, sometimes it's it's personal, um, you know, rooted in pain. People use drugs for a lot of different rec uh, reasons, from recreational to spiritual to um, you know to to pain. Um, and some people develop addictions and and problematic drug use. And I you know I. I won't say that that this is the the sole cause, but I think there's you know there's a lot to be said for um, you know declining um, social services, public services opportunities, um, and in, an increase in addictive behaviors. Well, we talked a little bit at the outset of of this sort of enforcement interdiction kind of model. You've done work in Latin America. That, that's uh, sort of a big part of your portfolio. Talk a little bit about the foreign policy aspect of this. How does that approach to, to drugs and addiction affect how we relate to other countries? Yeah, well, I mean, historically, the U.S. has been kind of the creator of the war on drugs as we know it. And it, it started in this country, but then the United States tried to ex, uh, export its failed model to other countries, and it did so with bilateral agreements, with kind of aid money, with uh, security um, support and, and financial support, and then kind of trying to enshrine it in the, in the UN system um, of drug control. And uh, under... So, so historically, the U.S. has kind of pressed other countries to also follow a prohibitionist approach um, and help them to do that militarily and also tried to quell conversations around alternatives to drug prohibition. And we saw that change a little bit under uh, the Obama administration where for the first time um, there were a series of Latin American leaders who were saying, we can't do this anymore. Our continent is paying an extremely high price for this drug war in terms of deaths and disappearances and homicides and corruption and corrosion of rule of law. And it's just not sustainable and we want to talk about alternatives. Um, and it was, it was quite different for the president of the United States to say at the Summit of the Americas in 2012, you know, that's a legitimate topic for debate. And we need to look at whether our, our drug policies are doing more harm than good. 
And so I think under, under his administration, we saw the U.S. kind of rolling back a little bit some of its really heavy-handed approach elsewhere and, and allowing some flexibility and some other countries to, to move forward with their own policies. Um, with this current administration, we're hearing some of the old rhetoric again, the really supply side enforcement. It's up to other governments to, to cut the supply off, to burn their coca fields, to stop the poppy, to stop the manufacturing of drugs. And it really kind of outsources the, the issue rather than, than figuring out ways to deal with it um, internally. And so even some of the conversations um, that that you know, this government is having with Colombia, really kind of putting them under the spotlight to reduce their uh, their coca cultivation, and now some of the the conversations we're hearing around um, the manufacture of fentanyl in China, it it really kind of harks back to blaming a lot of other countries for a problem we, we also need to deal with. And of course, there needs to be uh, international cooperation um, on drug policy and drug control, but it can no longer be this kind of militarily enforced U.S. dominant punitive approach. Well, uh, and an alternative approach would be uh, something that we often hear about Portugal, for example, which in 2001 decriminalized everything. So mm -hmm. talk a little bit about the thinking behind that. Sure. So, I mean, I think two countries, when, when I refer to us looking outside of our borders to, to other countries that have done well, um, I think two, two countries that come up are, are Portugal and Switzerland, because both of those enacted public health pro uh, policies right after facing severe drug crises. Well, and, um, and in the case of Portugal, I think it was something like uh, fully 1% of the population was HIV positive, mm -hmm. had the, uh, the highest rate in, uh, in Europe. Uh, so, yes. so, it was, yeah, so it was dire. It so. was dire, yeah. Portugal in, in the 90s faced the, the highest problematic use of, of heroin um, and, and huge rates of, of HIV infections, especially amongst people who injected uh, drug, drugs. And at the time, they really chose a pretty radical approach, especially at that moment, and said, all right, you know, instead of locking everyone up who uses drugs and uses heroin, we are going to try decriminalizing the use and possession of all drugs. That's from marijuana to heroin. So what they do in Portugal is if you're found with um, using or, or possessing drugs, they put you in front of what's called a, a dissuasion commission. And that is out of the hands of, of the criminal uh, justice um, and police. And, and courts, so you sit around a table almost like this with a, a lawyer, um, a health professional, and a, a social worker, and they kind of discuss your drug use with you. And, and decide almost on a case-by-case -case basis, um, but never imposing any criminal sanctions. But they can, the kind of, the, the sanctions can range from either letting you off if they don't think you have problematic use, um, to if, if they see that you've developed some problematic use, they can either refer you to treatment, it's never mandated, um, because you know that's not eth ethical either, but they can refer you to humane treatment if you're ready to, to engage in that. Um, they can impose administrative uh, sanctions like fines, um, but they usually try to, to refrain from doing that, especially if someone has a dependency because they don't want to place an extra economic burden on them. Um, with the whole, the whole idea of not punishing people who use drugs um, and then offering them pretty wraparound uh, treatment. So it's meant that since they did that in 2001, they've seen a lot more people in treatment voluntarily. Um, they you know, distribute clean syringes. They distribute free methadone in, in mobile vans. Um, they make uh, other uh, treatments free to the population. And since they did that over a decade ago, there have been you know, a vast amount of studies on it. Their HIV related, uh, their HIV transmissions have gone down, their HIV related deaths have gone down, overdoses have gone down um, without any major increases in drug use. So it really, it really is a model that I think we should look to and both um, important to stress that we shouldn't criminalize and we should actually move towards decriminalization, but also we need to supplement that with really strong public health and harm reduction methods. So let's talk a little bit about the specifics of what some of those harm reduction methods might look like. And uh, you've, you've in other places articulated some of them. So let's just go through them. 
What uh, about opioid substitution therapy? Okay, sure. So, um, so first I'll just say that, that harm reduction as a, as a philosophy um, relies on, on the, the fact that we, what we want, what's what most important to us is to reduce the, the risky and harmful behaviors associated with drug use rather than having the only goal be abstinence itself. And, and, and the harm is to society as a whole, not just to the individual user. Right? Exactly, that true, that too. So, um, so it's, it's, it's a di divergent model from some of the treatment modalities we see that, that require abstinence. And sometimes those can be really harmful because, you know, they're, Relapse is a normal part of, of drug use and, and recovery. People can't um, often uh, stop using immediately. They might not want to. They might not be ready now or ever indefinitely. So the idea is you still want to reduce the, the harms associated with that. So I would, I would say there are right now just five examples of really great harm reduction methods that have been used in other places um, and have been given... Have, have given rise to excellent public health results that we could look to. And... Um, you know, the first is we need to expand access to naloxone um, and make it available uh, free or low cost to this is the police drug that, uh, that reverses. reverses overdoses. Exactly. So um, they are expanding it already in the United States. Some police forces are carrying it, but we need to also get it into the hands of family members, whoever's going to be around someone who might overdose, because you know you just you can't treat someone um, if they're no longer alive, and so it, it provides. Um, it, it resuscitates, it reverses an overdose, and then you can provide the support to that person. So naloxone is very important. And what you just mentioned, um, uh, uh, opiate substitution therapy, is, um, is a set of, of medicines, mostly methadone and, and buprenorphine, which are opioid agonist um, treatments, that can be uh, continued sort of as long as needed, maybe even indefinitely. Um, and take away the withdrawal symptoms from other opioids and allow people to live kind of a, a fully, uh, a full life and, and re-engage in work. Um, and those have been the treatments that have been shown to cut overdose deaths by 50% and they're supported by the uh, WHO, the World Health Organization. So something a little more provocative, uh, heroin assisted treatment. Right. So, okay. So, um, yeah, this is. So methadone, OST, um, we have in, in the States, and we just really need to, to scale that up. But there are going to be some people who don't respond to methadone and buprenorphine. And for those people, heroin-assisted treatment is, is a treatment that they started in Switzerland when they were also in the midst of a heroin crisis. And what it is is, you know, it's medically prescribed heroin. So it's, you know, pure, unadulterated, unadulterated uh, untoxined um, heroin that is prescribed by doctors to people who can't stop using heroin um, and they're given clean syringes and sterile equipment in a center um, and they can come in as many times as they need always under the supervision of a, of a medical professional and there has never been a single overdose in, in a heroin assisted treatment facility and it again allows people to go out and, and live their lives so this is something that doesn't exist um, in the Americas, but I think it's extremely important for us to start looking at it because well, it has existed other places. And uh, we've got uh, just a little over a minute left, but I, I wanted to, to get to the change in mindset. I mean, this is like accepting the fact as a society that some people are just going to have these behaviors and we're going to manage it rather than try to eliminate it. That's a, a fairly substantial shift in attitudes. How, where it's been done, was it accomplished? Right. So the, the cultural change is going to be important. We have to stop stigmatizing people who use drugs. We have to stop using demeaning language. And we have to treat them as, as worthy of every single you know, support and medical um, intervention that they need and want. And I think in other countries, um, it, it did come, come from the political leadership. They just decided, they studied the issue and said, this is what needs to be done. And then they proved that it worked and the public followed. I don't think we're going to see that in this country. So it has to come from us. We have to change our, our attitudes. And, and I think that you know, one of the tragic things about this, this epidemic is it's hit so many people, but it's also might be changing mind frames around, um, around loved ones who, who struggle with addiction and, and might help us move from the demonization to the hu humanization. So, but that is a really important cultural shift that has to happen. Well, we'll uh, have to keep an eye on that. I think it, it won't come overnight, but we'll see. Hanan, sir, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for having me.
Our viewers, we'll see you next time on International Focus. This program is made possible in part by the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, one of America's top research universities, preparing students for today's interdependent world with internationally focused academic and outreach programs.